Oh hell. Oh hell man, let me turn off or at least maybe that's better. Turn turn the air conditioner on fan. I forgot to do that. Boy, I clicked on there, but I, I am considerate about my limited viewership because I took a guitar box and I put it up against the window where usually there's like a blaze of a thousand suns worth of light coming through there to try to uh, help with the lighting a little bit. That's kind of a funny story of what came in that box. In my desperation to cling to uh, uh, any kind of cheerfulness in the constant battle against depression, and since I play guitar, I found out they make these things called fret light guitars where the fretboard actually lights up and uh, shows you where to put your fingers if you want to learn how to play which I already know how to play but you, it, you can learn like it has like advanced and intermediate uh, applications to it but it's really good a good thing for a beginner to have because it shows you where to put your fingers and it shows you how to make your basic chords and scales and whatnot so anyways I bought this guitar in hopes of uh, learning some things and giving me something to do to keep me occupied since I got you know leftover meth people living in the building as we speak and I had that whole meth situation going on so I'm a left-handed guitar player now I could have got a right-handed uh, fret lake guitar for like 150 bucks but because I'm left-handed I had to buy a left-handed guitar because I figured you know you can flip the strings around like Jimi Hendrix would play a guitar upside down he'd play a right-handed guitar left-handed and just flip the strings around and he'd restring the guitar and anyways I said figured well you can't restring the lights so if I want the lights to be in the right place I gotta buy a left-handed guitar guess what happened I bought a left-handed guitar and it had right-handed lights and I'm like you gotta be shitting me this doesn't even make any sense and you know I talked to the person I bought it off of and they were like oh I bought it new and I had to switch the lights too and I'm like well he's lying that doesn't make any sense at all because why would they have a left-handed guitar with right hand why would they sell it that way from the factory you know but I think you can just get into the software and you can actually flip the lights around so it's a double whammy because not only did I uh, not get what I wanted when I bought it it's like I could have paid like two hundred dollars less I paid 375 for what was in, in that box that's where's my where's the camera in that box back here that's blocking out some of the light that was three hundred and seventy five dollars I could have paid hundred and fifty dollars for it but it has a little disc that you put in your computer and you can you can also hook it up to uh, smartphones and stuff like that if you get another version of the of fret light guitar but I thought it would be a cool thing you know and uh, it's just funny to me that it's like yes again the curse of the left-hander strikes because you know as left-handed guitar player I go to people's houses and there's like always right-handed guitars and I can't play them because I'm left-handed and uh, I used to actually know a few things that I could play on upside down strings but I don't do that no more I, I gave up doing that and people be like because for one thing people would think you could play really good like wow you could even play a guitar with the strings upside down I'm like you can just I just learned a few things just <laughs> upside down but anyways that's kind of funny um, as far as my uh, general mental, mental state and the benzo thing uh, the update on the news with the uh, squatters and I don't know these people's names the landlord don't know these people's names I was just out in the hallway making some noise and I, I think she made some noise in reply to my noise but I'm gonna have to talk to her and I'm like super angry you know because she's a holdover from when they had to if you'll remember if you watch my videos you know that uh, the, a meth cookhouse opened across the street for me I could literally stand on my porch and hit it with a rock and so that you know she's a, whether she's a user or not there was people using and selling out of the uh, little mini apartment building I live in with only four units so it was like having drug dealers and tweakers and uh, creeps living in your house basically because what I live in is just this this space here this is just a big gigantic unbelievably huge house that they sectioned off into four apartments so it's like they're living it's like if you had people living in your if you live in a house if it's like if you had drug dealers and uh, meth heads and people you didn't know uh, 
living in, in your upstairs area, you know, because I have the same entrance that they have, you know, I, I have, we both come in the same and go out the same door. And then, so I have like, uh, had like tweakers and meth heads and general creepy looking bastards, uh, walking past my door all, all hours of the night. And there's, you know, the, anyways, the update on that is the landlord yesterday served the eviction papers and she's still up there. And I saw two creepy people today. I didn't like the looks of, uh, getting in a car and there's been like random people in here and I've had crazy, uh, thoughts, you know, because of the stress level that the whole situation put me on there. And I, I have a machete, so that's what I've been, you know, keeping by me in case there's any trouble because I'm too crippled up to fist fight anymore or defend myself just hand to hand. But the problem is a machete. You don't nick somebody like you're nicking yourself shaving with the machete. If you want him to live, you better bring a machete and a belt because you're going to have to tourniquet the guy or he's going to bleed out. So it's, you know, it's like, it's a deadly weapon. It's worse than a baseball bat bringing a machete. So but anyway, that's what I got. But I was having these thoughts. Like I was watching the all-star game, which uh, was, I think last Tuesday, and uh, there was like three hood-looking 20-year-olds hanging out on the porch. And my windows, I'm watching TV, and like they're literally like five feet away from the TV that I'm watching. They're just on the porch, you know. And I started having crazy thoughts, and I was like, "What if I just walked out there with the machete and said, hello, how you guys doing? My name's Steve.'" And then looked at the machete and said, "And this is Earl." Steve likes you, but I'm not so sure about Earl. You know, just crazy. Am I, you know, that's what I want to do is I just want to run them all out of here. I just want to run them, all, run everybody off. And I, you know, I want to take it to that level. You know, it feels like self-defense at this point because I'm losing my freaking mind. Uh, you know, between the benzo thing and uh, all the other problems I have, then I have to deal with these stupid sons of bitches trying to keep my voice quiet. I have a very loud voice. It's not that I don't want them to hear hear me. It's like I don't want to start yelling. But uh, I got these cocksuckers living upstairs. And uh, and the landlord don't even know their names. You know, They're just giving them a name. I was like, do you even know a last name for this person? No. He knows the one person is Clint and the other person is Jessica with no last name. No information about Adam at all. No, Don't know where they work, if they work, anything. You know, they're just squatters. So, uh, I'm stressed out because I have to, I have to talk to her and I'm really, really angry and I don't know how I can do that. You know, I don't want to, it has to be done. I just have to tell her, look, man, I just have to talk to her like a human being. And I don't know, I've let myself get too angry. And, uh, she's the one that's living in the apartment though. It's the other scum. I feel more comfortable if it, I was approaching a dude cause I'm a large uh, man, even though I'm uh, uh, wobbly and my legs don't work. I'm large and you know, I don't want, yeah, you know, it's kind of like not part of my code or whatever to go intimidating women or something like that. Just the idea that I would be confrontational with them and someone my size and someone where she, she knows she's um, getting evicted and she knows how unwelcome she is here already. But I like to talk to her like a human being and just break it down and say, look, man, you've had time to get out of here. It's like, uh, you, you, you can wait through the eviction process, but I'm going to make it real unpleasant for you living here. Cause she doesn't have a, a key to the front door. And I was thinking about just locking her out. She only has a key to the apartment. You got to have a key to the front door to get in. And then you got to have a key to your apartment. There are different keys. So I was thinking about just locking her out and being, a, being a bastard, you know, but uh, that seems wrong to me without talking to her and telling her that, I, that to expect shit like that. Another idea that I got from somebody is they actually sell this thing called liquid ass. Which is, uh, you, if you're old like me, you remember the old fashioned stink bombs. Apparently this stuff is really nasty and it just lingers and lasts. And it just exactly what it is, liquid ass. It just smells horrible. I could actually stick a tube underneath her door and just make the apartment uninhabitable. And I don't know if I want to take it there either because uh, I don't really know who I'm dealing with. And I, I kind of, some sick part of me wants to go to that bloody level, but uh, the rational part of me is still like, you know, just let it play out. But my nerves are so fried from me being passive and non-confrontational and having to 
you know, I'm just trying to keep the eyes on the prize here and deal with my benzo thing. And uh, my other problems uh, that I haven't wanted to be, I don't want to be confrontational with a bunch of fucking drug addicts. That just doesn't make any sense in my book. That's a lose-lose situation. However that comes out, it's not going to be good. You're not dealing with rational people. So um, I just kind of let things go. I mean, I called the police. I complained to the landlord. I did with, you know, the citizen type stuff. I didn't take it to the vigilante level, which, you know, I'm close to getting there. And I've been close a couple of times. And just like, you know, if I was younger and didn't uh, have all them health problems, and had a little bit better control of my temper, I would take it to that level. Because most people are pussies, frankly. Most most people, if you confront them and you look them in the eye and you let them know, like, not only am I not afraid of you, but there's a little bit of crazy in me and you don't want to access it. You know, I've done that. That's how I survived. I haven't gotten in a fight. I used to walk, like, all, all hours of the night after I got CRPS and back surgeries and all that stuff. And I bluffed my way out of so many fights and so many confrontations in the times where the bluff didn't work and I was dealing with a crazy person or a very large person well then I back down because I ain't that crazy but you know if, if if I lose my temper it won't matter how big they are or whatever what I'm dealing with I'm just like an insane person when I uh, lose my temper completely when I'm completely gone you know I can get mad and it's from all the repression and you know I have CRPS which uh, doesn't uh, do well with stress and bad emotions and stuff so I don't express anger and I don't express uh, uh, grief and sadness and all that uh, physically because it makes me really sick and but uh, I've been repressing those emotions and it's been making me not want to eat and uh, it's, a, it's affected me really negatively which also makes me feel like it's self-defense if I break out the machete <laughs> just run them out of here just like like uh, you know, I don't want to go there. I don't want to take it to no street level. I just don't want to do that. Um, but at the same time, if I'm, I'm going to have like six more weeks, I'm not going to be able to, I don't know if I can do even one more week of having people that are just scummy looking, burn up drug addicts come in here without doing something. I mean, what can you do? Uh, I, all that passivity is just killing me. So yeah, there's all my gripes. Blah, blah, blah. Gripe, gripe, gripe. That's what's going on with me. As far as the Benzo thing, I slipped on it and was... Uh, oh, a couple of times I took like um, double my taper a few days trying to regulate my uh, sleep. It didn't work anyway, so... I think it worked once, actually. Yeah, it worked once, but a couple of other times it didn't even work. And that makes me doubly angry is that, you know, I got people with addictions up there messing with my physical dependence that I'm trying to uh, get off of because they're putting my nerves more on edge and my nerves are already on edge because of the benzo thing so I always feel like I'm talking really fast but then when I go back and listen to it it's like well I'm, I wasn't really talking real fast and I feel like I'm talking like at a normal speed and it's slower so <laughs> I was thinking for a minute there I must be yammering away like really fast but, uh, yeah, I, I was super stressed out today. I, You know, I talked to a couple of people and um, talked to my landlord for about 25 minutes and uh, um, kind of mellowed out a little bit. But, yeah, I was, I, I, I was doing, like, um, routinely 30-hour spreads between uh, 30 to 60-hour spreads between a uh, quarter milligrams, which is pretty close to, uh, um, to switching you know, just to quit taking Xanax and just to take volume when I need it, which is how you're supposed to do it. But then this stuff happened with the meth cookhouse opening up and then it screwed me all up. And it wasn't even like I was using it as an excuse because you got to understand that's an extremely stressful situation to have freaking tweakers uh, like walking past your door at three, four, five in the morning and knowing that you got to keep the lights on and knowing that you got to worry about your stuff getting stolen or your house getting broken into. And uh, as I said in the other other video, uh, meth heads or tweakers or whatever you want to call them, they don't sleep. And when you don't sleep uh, for a couple of days, you get psychotic and uh, you get crazy. And so they're, they're 
meth heads are among the most dangerous uh, creatures on the planet that have been tweaking for a few days because they get, you know, well, everybody's seen Breaking Bad, so I'm probably uh, wasting your time describing it. You probably already know what that's all about. But I, I had a Breaking Bad thing going on here in my building, and, you know, I don't feel like that's an excuse to backslide. I felt like I didn't have any choice just to try to keep the grip and not get violent and stupid and, you know, just try to uh, hold on to my last little threads of sanity here. Another thing I did was I cleared my whole schedule. I go to the psychiatrist on the 31st of July and I just pushed everything back into August, which uh, I think that actually affected my stress negatively. Maybe I should have went to my appointments instead of uh, pushing them back. I don't know. I don't know. I was just like super stressed and I was like, well, maybe if I just push my schedule back until this situation resolved itself, then I would um, start feeling um, you know, that, that stress would leave me and I don't know, I'm going to my um, psychiatry appointment on the 31st hell or high water though and then um, yeah so right now I just took a dose of uh, a quarter milligram of Xanax and that was a 52 hour spread but I'm using volume in the middle so I don't know if that's cheating or not but the whole point is to like switch from one to the other so you know I did 56 hours the day before and then I did uh, uh, 52 hours um, and just took it a little bit ago actually before I started making this video is exactly when I took it but hopefully I'm making sense and uh, yeah I don't I don't feel too coherent I don't sleep at night because I got criminals living in my you know, living in my building that have access to the house that I live in. If, if if this was a house and not an apartment building, you got your front door and then you got your bedrooms. We'll call the apartments bedrooms. And uh, so the people whose bedrooms upstairs are fucking criminals. And that's not, not a tolerable situation for me. And the guy that lived in there that used to be the person that's up there right now is a uh, boyfriend was a breaking and entering guy the cops uh, he's about to get convicted on multiple counts of breaking and entering he's probably going to go away for a few years he's in jail right now awaiting trial so you know you don't want to have breaking and entering people living in your apartment building with you <laughs> it's not good it's not good and then to have them selling dope or selling meth out of uh, the place you're living in bringing around tweakers and I saw that phenomenon many times in the last two months of uh, why are these people out walking in front of my house at six o'clock in the morning they don't look like they're ready to go to work they're just kind of walking around because tweakers don't sleep so you know the night never ends that that wasn't the morning to them that was still the night you know I saw even like arguments at eight o'clock nine o'clock in the morning in front of the building the thing that had me thinking that it was a heroin thing and not a meth thing is like I, I knew, knew peop, people that got hooked on meth, but uh, I never was around, like, we'll call it meth culture, but I was never really around it. I always figured, like, meth people were loud, so I was like, well, her heroin people, you know, they nod and stuff. They're qu they're quiet. And I said, these people up here are relatively quiet. I was like, it seems weird that they would be using meth they're probably using heroin so I thought it was heroin and somebody else put that idea in my mind uh, too that there was heroin being used and sold out of there but it turned out to be meth and you know I guess they were just being quiet because they were doing illegal things they want to draw attention to themselves and the arguments and stuff they happened outside and the loudness happened outside there was very few incidents of any any noise coming from upstairs at all just a few times one time I did get woke up at 3 30 in the morning um, when uh, the Clint guy was cleaning the place out the guy who called himself Clint was uh, cleaning the place out and putting the garbage in the hallway across from my door which you know that's a repeat uh, to anybody that's uh, listened to this I don't know uh, you never know like you know, if, if you like if you get I assume that I don't have any new viewers. I always just assume that. So, <laughs> so.
So yeah, I, I, I don't like to say the same things over and over again, like uh, people of my generation might be prone to do. Uh, anyways, um, so yeah, it's not a good situation, and it's like I'm gotta find that she's not gonna answer the door for me. I know that already, so I have to kind of like catch her when she's leaving and uh, you know have a word with her and uh, try to be in a good frame of mind when I do it and just let her know you know like I heard you got your paper served on you you, you don't legally have a right to live here anymore so you know I'm not gonna make it fun for you living here I, I have to figure out some way to say it without it sounding like a threat I think that's probably the best way. It's like it's you can squat here, but it's not going to be fun for you. And, uh, I don't know. I just don't want to be involved with any of this nonsense. I got enough uh, stuff to deal with. And I won't run through that catalog of what my sister called uh, my litany of woes that she didn't want to hear. Um, I first heard that phrase in a in a mental hospital where a guy was. I was. Shh, it wasn't a mental hospital, it was a psychiatric ward. I'm trying to remember which one, because I, I was only in a couple. I was in uh, Akron General Psychiatric Unit and uh, Cleveland Clinic Psych Psychiatric Unit, both when I was a teenager. And uh, I think I was in four, yeah, I was in four psychiatric units in my life. The first time was uh, when I got. Uh, addicted to morphine in the hospital and I went off of morphine and had withdrawal symptoms and uh, had a psychotic break when I had spinal surgeries when I was like 16 and then when I was 17 uh, I was in um, uh, I think I was screwing around with yeah I was screwing around with the prescription pills and uh, I, I, my folks thought I OD'd which I didn't OD but that's what they had in their mind that I tried to kill myself so I ended up in uh, um, another psychiatric unit when I was 17. And I admitted myself for depression in Akron General when I was 20. And then uh, this year when I was 50, so there's a 30 year gap there, I believe. Yeah. About a 30 year gap I admitted myself this year because uh, frankly, I was uh, looking for other avenues to get help, but I was all, it was also mainly because I was going through withdrawal. And I was like, well, I was thinking about going to a psychiatric place and trying to get some help for my CRPS. Uh, that way, trying to find some uh, uh, medical attention that way. Anyways, and I already know what withdrawal is like, and... At least they'll keep me medicated in there so I don't have to go through uh, cold turkey withdrawal. Which uh, I suppose I could have talked to my doctor about it, but I, that's just the way I did it. So, uh, anyways. So, yeah, it's been a fun life. But yeah, when I was a teenager is when I had spinal reconstruction and spinal tumor and CRPS. All that stuff happened to me between the ages of uh, um, 14 and uh, 20 so you know clearly that's uh, certainly you know there should be no stigma attached to mental illness at all and they were like saying I was manic depressive and you know how the well, if you're watching this you're probably familiar with the haphazard scattershot diagnosis technique of a psychiatrist where they're just like well you seem like this we'll call you this and give you this you know, so I was a manic depressive for a while, supposedly. You know, what really happened is was I had a psychotic episode when I was 16, when I had a spinal tumor, because it was just all too much for me to handle. And then I had, uh, they were giving me more morphine, and I got um, addicted to it and had, or physically dependent on it, and had withdrawal symptoms from it. So, um, yeah. But. Yeah, that's, I feel like now I've entangled you into a, a whole web. <laughs> a, a whole snarled mess. The snarled mess that is my life. By bringing up all that old stuff. But uh, the new stuff is, yeah. 
I called my brother-in-law, which I haven't talked to him for, uh, I don't know, like six, seven months, just because I was angry with him, and he didn't even remember what I was angry about, just because he, uh, he just liked that, I mean, uh, he's a, you know that's just how he is but he didn't even remember what I was angry or he didn't understand you know he didn't know what what it was all about or whatever but uh, I'm not gonna go into that but yeah that that was I was like man I feel horrible anyway I might as well go do something difficult to try to make myself feel better so I'll talk to this guy that I actually lived with for like a year and a half and used to be close to and ask him how he's doing since he ain't reached out to me I'll reach out to him and it did make me feel a little better. I explained to him that I got anger issues. And boy, do I got anger issues. And I was like, I was just, you know, I was angry at you. And I told him why I was angry at him. And he's like, I don't even remember any of that. And I'm like, I'm not, you know, I didn't say it. But I was thinking to myself, I'm not surprised. You know, he's not surprised. He's just uh, the way he is. And, um. Uh, Really, you kind of got to look at yourself in a situation like that because you're like, once you know somebody for so long, you know how they are. You know, you can't go up to a fish and expect to part its hair in, in the middle and get and brush its hair. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> you, you, you can't go up to a bird and try to dribble it like a basketball. You got to know, you know what you're dealing with. So, uh, yeah, you can't really, It's it still made me angry and I felt justified in my anger, but I know who I'm dealing with. So it's like uh, it's kind of on me. I... <laughs> Man, life is so crazy, and people are crazier still. And uh, I don't know. I don't. I've been going crazy with this situation here, and it's just like uh, uh, mainly the worst thing you can do in life, people. And I honestly believe that is just to be passive and let stuff happen. Because that is a sure way to have life run you over like an 18-wheeler. So, you know, I've just been being passive with my situation. Like, uh, at first I was, like, just calling the landlord and telling him about stuff. And then it got worse and worse. And I was like, there's a flop house situation upstairs. The guy that the cops are looking for, he's just leaving the door open to let anybody come in there. Literally anybody. You know, I, I, I may have already said this before, and I apologize if I did. But I heard a ridiculous conversation one day on a Saturday uh, where this girl comes in there and I I hadn't seen her before I didn't know who she was but she's arguing with this guy named Greg and she's like Greg I don't know what you're doing man you gotta get out of here you're gonna get yourself arrested and he's like I can't leave and she's like well if you stay you're gonna get arrested by the cops he's, he's, and Greg's like I can't leave I got some of my stuff in here the, the door's unlocked and 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 the the girl doesn't, didn't get it. She was like, uh, uh, "Well, the bitch leave the door unlocked all the time." And so he's like, "No, you don't understand." It's like if I leave, somebody will come in here and steal my stuff. You know, and she she goes, "Well, you do what you want," and she storms out. You know, and then he's actually literally on the porch biting his fingernails. You know, deciding, "Do I leave and uh, not get arrested?" But uh, risk get my stuff stolen or do I stay and guard my stuff and maybe get dragged away by the police so that's the kind of such this was like good lord this was like about a month ago this happened you know so this has been an ongoing nightmare for uh, about two months um, it's the uh, 24th today they they busted the meth house on the 6th the mess the meth house was up and running probably I would say at least a month before that you know, I noticed my first drug deal deal with uh, the new guy, whose name is not Greg, by the way. It's Scott. That's the guy that was actually on the lease. Greg was just another guy that just happened to be, you know, a random guy off the street that just happened to be uh, crashed there for a moment. And, uh, yeah. It's just this, this kind of madness. I mean, like I said, it's like when you're going through benzo... Uh, withdrawal and you're trying to concentrate and focus on that that's all you need you don't need extra stuff like a flop house apartment next to you like tweakers walking past your door at four and five in the morning like any of my various health issues or my difficulties walking or my family drama it's like all you need is that one thing because that one thing is a is a pit bull to be dealt with 
you know that that one just that just the whole winning process off of a uh, benzo it's like uh, you know I was even gonna like name this thing something dramatic like uh, uh, benzos steal your soul or something like that I was feeling feeling very dramatic earlier but it, they do change your personality and uh, block memory you know my memory is not as sharp and I don't I think that's I can tell when I'm going through uh, the withdrawal thing it's like I my brain doesn't quite work right and that's when I know it's I call it I just call it brain fog I mean I think that's what everybody calls it but I can feel that brain fog coming on when I'm talking to somebody and it's like okay I'm stretching my limits now you know and uh, I guess in the grand scheme of things even with all the drama and uh, uh, the machete nonsense and <laughs> the tweakers and worrying about losing my temper and turning into a madman on people I don't even know you know like uh, in the context really of my life uh, my whole withdrawal process started on March 18th that's four months ago now I guess I'm still doing pretty good I guess it just feels like when you're in the middle of it it's like it's like being in the middle of a river when you're being swept downstream you don't know nothing but the stream man you don't you don't know know where you're at because I had that experience when I almost drowned to get swept downstream by a river and uh, you got no idea where you're at or what's going on and I might as well launch into that story right now so I'm a kid I'm 15 years old I'm camping in a real remote area got bears and everything and it's in uh, on the uh, way out in the woods on the Pennsylvania New York border and uh, anyways so it's been raining and raining so the rivers are all swollen up there's no place to get cleaned up teenage boys tend to stink so the only water water that was there was the coldest water running that I've ever seen it was liquid ice and I'm like these kids were tougher than me that I was camping with and they were putting their heads underneath this stuff and shrieking <laughs> like little girls so I'm like I ain't even I, I felt the water and I was like holy crap that's like ice I'm like I'm not doing that I'm like I'm gonna go take a bath in the river I told everybody so I took a towel I took some soap and I went down to the river I don't remember the name of the river it had some kind of Indian name to it but uh, it was probably oh it was over a football field wide and it was swollen up with the uh, the rain and the current was pretty quick so I stripped down and take off all my clothes except for my underwear and I think at the time I wasn't wearing boxers I think that was in my jockey days or whatever they call the other kind of underwear so I'm in my underwear I got my uh, bar of soap I weighed into the stream that uh, into the stream I rate I, I wade into this river and I'm like this current's fast you know and I, I'm not a good swimmer key point to the story I am not a good swimmer I can I, I, I can't swim okay I'll be honest I never learned how to swim I could doggy paddle I can float on my back and I can do the backstroke but I never learned how to regular swim like a front front crawl it's just something that nobody ever taught me and uh, I never learned so I'm 15 years old I don't know how to swim I wade into this river I go in to about I don't know you can't see where I'm gesturing so I go in a little bit over my stomach I'm like this current's pretty quick you know and I'm holding on to these mulberry bush uh, sticks and stuff so I can have a free hand to scrub myself up with to wash with the soap and uh, guess what happens with soap people and you try to grab on to something well that's what happened I lost my grip on the, the mulberry bush and getting clean was suddenly the last thing from my mind because I got swept down that river and I started to drown and uh, I'm like flailing away and panicking and um, you know getting off into the off into the wild man just float just flown downstream in that uh, in that river and that current was strong and I was like well you know I I was like I know how to float on my back so I floated on my back and I just tried to keep the panic from taking over because I guess that's how you drown is the panic part so I was like I was just floating on my back and trying to breathe and like uh, using my arms and legs 
So I didn't know how to do the front crawl, they call it, or regular swimming. I didn't know how to do that. So I, I'm laying in the river, you know, and, and I'm spitting water, and it's just washing me. It's probably got me at least a mile downstream by now. And I, and I look up, like, past my body, and I see uh, just a little twig, just a little twig. But I was like, why is this twig moving faster than I am? And then the twig got closer and closer to me, and it turns out the twig was attached to a big old stump, a big stump. And I righted myself, like, and tried to, like, adjust my, my pattern. You know, I got off my back. I seen it was going to hit me. And that just made it worse because then it broadsided me and smashed into my ribs and it knocked me ass over tea kettle and I was panicking and drowning all over again. So I'm panicking all over again, flailing around, spitting water, about to drown again and I managed to calm down and uh, float on my back again. And I was so panicked and, and scared at that point that uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't even check where I was in the river and the river had had put me into the shallows and I, I just like reached down with my hand and it, it turned out I was like in three feet of water tops I like reached down maybe two and a half feet of water two feet of water and I was like look to over to my side and there was the bank not too far away and I'm like okay I'm not gonna drown part two of the story is I'm like I got no idea where I'm at I'm in my underwear I don't have shoes I'm out in the wilderness I'm naked and afraid and I realize another very important fact. I am on the wrong side of the river. I can't swim and I'm on the wrong side of the river to get back to civilization. So I'm like, oh shit. You know, I start thinking it's going to be getting dark here in a, in a couple hours, man. I, I, I'm like, I can't be in, I'm going to freeze, you know, I'm panicking. I'm like, I'm going to freeze to death. I wasn't thinking about bears or animals or anything like that. I'm like, I was just like, I'm going to freeze to death. I'm going to be in the woods and it's going to get cold and I'm going to be naked. <laughs> and I don't know shit about survival, but I remembered when we drove along that river that there was an old fashioned footbridge somewhere along that river. And I'm like, if I can find that footbridge, I can get back onto the right side, the camp side of the river. So I'm like, I'm just going to keep walking until I find that footbridge. So I kept walking, and I kept walking in bare feet, on sticks and stones. I tried, you know, walking through the woods, and and uh, bare feet not really an option. So I stuck by the river. There was like gravel alongside the river, but it hurt like a bitch. And then I was like, it took me a while. I don't know how far, but it took a while to where I was like, please, bridge up here. <laughs> Can anybody find that confounded bridge? So. I found the bridge and it was like an old fashioned one with boards and like the ropes and stuff, you know, and, and it kind of like shook back and forth. I, I wasn't afraid of heights at the time, so I was just happy to have a way across the river. But I, So I, I walked on that old fashioned footbridge across the river and got onto the proper side of the river, but then I had about a two mile walk, literally a two mile walk to get back to camp. And uh, I didn't know the way. <laughs> I didn't know the way, the way back to camp or what direction. I don't I have no sense of direction, so I'm like, I'm gonna stay beside the river, and just do what I did to get to the bridge, and just, you know, torture my feet on these stones, and uh, walk home that way. So I just kept walking alongside the river, and I heard some voices. And I'm, I did a wide loop around them because I'm, you gotta remember now I'm walking in my underwear and nothing else, and I don't want to be seen. So, I heard voices of somebody fishing, and I'm like, man, that means I'm close to camp. So I did a loop around them into the woods and you know, hurt my feet a little bit, and come back around and uh, found my clothes. I got dressed, and then I had to walk back to camp, and I'm dying of thirst, so I'm drinking like with my hand out of uh, streams and stuff and uh just random just there was some clear streams and some pretty good water there that i was just drinking wild and uh by the time i made it back to camp it was almost full dark and people was like where were you at and i'm like i don't want to talk about it and then i just went off by myself and i did not want to talk about it 
<laughs> so yeah, that's 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 what happened. The funny part to me is the stick floating in the water because I can still see that part. I can see that in the footbridge clearer than everything than anything because I was looking so hard for that footbridge. I still remember what that looks like. And this is uh, 35 years ago. And I remember that little stick floating in the water and me thinking, why is this little tiny stick moving faster than me? And it was moving faster than me because it had a greater surface of resistance in the form of a big old stump that uh, apparently that storm broke off a piece of a log or it was a stump. I don't know. You know, it, all I saw was a big piece of wood. And I didn't see it for very long because it smacked into the side of me and I went under and uh, it about drowned me but anyways I think that's a poor way to tell a story is to run back over it uh, but uh, yeah that's the story that's um, one of the top 10 most dramatic things that ever happened to me that's definitely top 10 uh, that's 41 minutes of your time which I thank you for hopefully you enjoyed my almost drowning story and uh yeah, this is therapeutic for me, so uh, sorry about the frog in the throat. I got a pork frog in my throat. <coughs> that means it's time to go and drink some tea. So I'll talk to you next time. Be kind to each other. <laughs>